to pour some soft jaws. Let me see if I can hold this up here. We're gonna hold this part in the chuck jaws here and we need to bore some soft jaws to do such. And uh, because I wanna bore all the way through the jaws or almost all the way through the jaws, I really don't have any way to put a, any, any kind of spider in the jaws or a disc or something. And this is what I do when I need to do this. I put these rods, now I have these rods these are just um, some pieces of bar stock that happen to fit the chuck jaws here in the holes. And I stick them in here. And I've turned some radiuses or flat like radius things on one side of these, but you can use them actually, you could just use them straight like this as well. And it, this gives you a little bit of adjustment for different sizes. In fact, you could have different pins with different offsets on these. And what I usually use is just a piece of um, saw cut pipe, heavy wall pipe, to hold this and ring. And then, and then this bore in this pipe is a little bit larger than the bore I'm boring in the jaws. So I put some tension on the jaws like this. It's just one way I do this. Let me get this, I'm gonna kind of even this out here. I don't know if I have all these, uh, to get them approximately in the right location to begin with, you can look at these lines on the four jaw chuck. They use, most all four jaw chucks have these, uh, like um, grooves machined in the face. And this is kind of what they're designed for, is to uh, help you get things roughly centered by looking at some, some reference point on the jaw itself. I can see this one is further back than that one, just looking at the key. I kind of look at the key in relation to these, uh, these um, grooves on the face of the chuck. Now what I need to do is get a dial indicator. Let me get this, let me get the spindle over here, the machine. I'm moving the spindle over here, down. I've got to fix that light. I've got two problems with the lights on my machine. I've got, there's a, there's an LED. You can't really see it very well, but right there, there's an LED fixture that's not functioning. And this uh, fluorescent bulb needs to be changed, I guess. Kind of makes it a pain to record video when those things are malfunctioning like that. Um, I need to orient the spindle, clamp it. And I put my tool in here. I'm going to change this indicator for something a little less sensitive. And what I want to do in this case is um, I'm going to index the B axis also to 45. It gives me just a little more clearance on things. run this up here and get my dial indicator inside that ring. I, I want to I want to indicate this reasonably. It doesn't have to be perfect, but if I can fit it in here, let's see if I can fit it in there. If not, I'll have to tip it at an angle. Probably like this. This will work. This will be good enough for what I'm doing here. My zero up there like that. And what I want to do is get this ring to run reasonably true in here. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. That's actually not too bad that way. I'm going to re-zero my x-axis here a little bit. I'm going to run around to the other set of jaws. See they're quite a ways off. Which way am I going here? 
gotta go upward. I usually indicate on the top of the part and so it's kind of reversed here. It's confusing. Should bring this roughly back to zero. Okay. Now I want to tighten all the jaws more or less to zero. I'm going to go beyond and then tighten the other ones up to it. Well, maybe not. Got this, um, got this mag base sitting, you can't see it in the screen, but right here on this piece of pipe, I clamped to the machine. Getting in the way of my wrench in the bottom here. Let's just see. Pipe might not be round in the inside either. Just want to make sure all my jaws are tight. The idea being when you do something like this, you see that one's way off that side is to, um, I don't think the, the pipe is round on the inside and of course I'm probably distorting it with the pressure of the jaws here too. It's not absolutely necessary that this run perfectly true either because uh, we're going to bore the jaws after all but it just it just gets the jaws running about in the same place. In case I turn any high RPM, it's a little bit more balanced, I guess. Just want to make sure I got them all reasonably tight. With a four-jaw chuck, you could have three of the jaws tied and one loose. So you got to be kind of aware of that. It would probably be better if I actually uh, turn this indicator like this and indicate it uh, upward because what I'm adjusting here is I'm pushing on the jaw and it's distorting this pipe and I'm not really moving it down here you think about it so that's about ten thousandths see now this one I think that's going upward yeah just see it probably move a lot more when I tighten this now see so I can in reality I could probably if I want to get all these running exactly the same could probably just do that because I'm because I'm actually um, I'm actually bending the pipe. This one might, although I don't want to loosen that too much. That's probably good enough. It's within about 10 thousandths. And the, the, the wall, the pipe might vary here. See, right in that one spot, goes down. So the pipe's probably out around or wall thickness is very, but anyway, the purpose of this is to um, put the, um, a similar force on the chuck jaws that your clamping the part does. Because these are big jaws, and any jaw in a chuck, in any chuck, has a certain amount of play in the master jaw. It just has to, or it can't move, of course. So it'll tip back like this when you chuck onto something. 
So if you put something way back here in the master jaws or way back in the jaws themselves, the force is way back here and it doesn't put as much force way out here on the end of the jaws like you would want when you're chucking, well, what's gonna happen when you're chucking on the part. So when you chuck on the part, you're actually only grabbing way back here on the back end of the part and the front of the jaws are a little bit loose. Not totally loose, but looser and the part can move around in the chuck. So one way to minimize that is if you can't do this for some reason, like you just don't have the, the holes in the chuck don't work out or clearance or something, you put something back here and you do chuck onto it and you bore a taper in the jaws. And a very slight taper, a couple of a two or three thousandths taper in the jaws. So you're larger in the back and smaller out in the front. So when you chuck on the part, it puts more force out here on the end of the jaws or equalizes the force, if you will, because the jaws are gonna be springing backwards, you know, pivoting back this way. So this is the reason that I like to bore jaws if possible with um, something right out on the front of the jaws like this. Now, it depends, you know, if your boring bars, if your turret's gonna hit this and your boring bar's not long enough, you can't do this or something, then you can also bore a taper in the jaws or you can actually do both. Sometimes that, that helps too. But in this case, this is gonna be good enough. So now I've chucked onto this ring and I'm ready to bore the jaws. I need to set my zero point and I'm gonna set it on the face of the, in this case, on the face of the chuck. So I have to make sure I stand off with my tool coming down in here and don't hit this thing. So let me, uh, let me run this back up to zero, down in X. Put the Hamer probe in here. And we're gonna run over here, so we don't run into anything. I'm just gonna set my Z0 right on the face of this jaw here. It'll be good enough for the purpose of boring the jaws. I'm not sure if all these jaws are exactly the same height, although it looks like it's, they've been turned on the face, so they probably are pretty close. We're gonna teach zero there. All right. So anyway, this is a way, this is a way to bore chuck jaws and, and you can use different rings like I have different size to show you an example. I have, a, I have another one of these rings that's about this big and you can have different size rings. You can put different depth flats in these rods. If the chuck jaws are like this, I mean if your jaws are cut away for clearance or something back here like this or back at an angle like the top of these. I mean, this would still work because there's enough screw hole left in here, but um, then this is a little bit more difficult to do this way, but if the jaws are like this, or even shorter ones, you can do this with if you have shorter rods. And I've done this also on three jaw chucks. It works just as good on a three jaw chuck, even a hydraulic chuck, as long as the ring is thick enough or the pressure is turned down, it's better to bore jaws with the actual pressure that you're going to chuck with. But if you got maybe a device like this and it's too weak and it, or a little um, disc or something back in the jaws there, it'll crush it on a hydraulic chuck and you have to turn the pressure down. That's better than nothing, but it's better if the chuck pressure is the same as what you're using to, ch to bore with or to, you know, to chuck the part with when you bore the jaws. So anyway, now I gotta um, load the program up to the machine and we're gonna bore these jaws and it's a very simple bore. We're just doing a counter bore here, four in inches in diameter. And um, on a four jaw chuck, that's real easy to get to size because you, 
to measure across the jaws. On a three-jaw chuck, it's a little bit different situation. Unless you got um, a, one of those um, tri mics large enough to fit in the jaws, then it's easy enough. Let's see if we can run the program here. Going to run down in a slow rapid just in case. I think I've got everything right here. I think I've changed all the offsets. I was running that little vice fixture before and it might be a wise to be careful here. When the Sandvik uh, silent bar CNMG 432 insert. Forgot to make a setting on my, uh, in this free, the appropriate offset. Now this is where I want to slow down. It should be sitting two inches out in Z. I'm gonna come down here in single block. I want to check the insert on this tool. All right, stop. Check this insert here. Yeah. doesn't look too bad. I don't know what great insert that is. Uh, might not be perfect for this, but we're going to go with it. I'm going to kind of eyeball this and make sure I'm not... 2.6. Actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start over here. I'm going to check where my cut depth is here because it might be taking more than I want. It's these jaws. You can't really see in the video, but these jaws have a um, have kind of some steps in them, and I didn't really totally perfectly model those in the in the um, cam software. I just want to make sure I wasn't taking too big of a cut. Okay, I think we're all right. Let's start over again. Even still, I'm going to slow it down, even still now. No, no reason not to be careful. Okay, um, Maureen ch Chuck Jaws, you kind of got to feed a little bit slow when you're doing it. Otherwise, the intermittent cut just destroys the insert. I'm cutting a lot of air here. If I had modeled those jaws perfectly in the cam software, like the, all the steps in them and everything, it would have taken only the cuts it needed to, but I didn't take the time to do that. It just kind of like, it takes as much time to do that as just to cut the air to bore the jaws. I mean, uh, let's see what this does when it, Hits this back step in the in the jaws that's already there. It's getting close. Be almost hitting it now. I don't know if you can see it, but I can kind of there. It's hitting now. It's not too bad. That'll be all right. That first pass is going to be kind of deeper. Back in the back there. All right. No. We're we're um, running uh, 350 surface footage at eight thousandths per revolution feed on this uh, roughing passes. Like I said, I, I run at slower feed rate because of this intermittent cut, and it'll just break the insert if I try to do 12 or 15 thousandths per revolution feed. So I found it's, it works better if you just run it slower. And the surface footage slower too. This, I think those jaws are made out of like 1018 steel. And I could run a lot higher surface footage, but there again, it'll just uh, destroy the insert. Hear how good that silent bar runs? And it's, it's way longer than it needs to be. Those Sandvik silent bars are the best. I've tried, I've tried uh, all different brands, you know, I've tried 
Canamento, Manchester, um, Dorian, all these different brands, and these Sandvik ones really work the best. Although the, the, the silent bar will flex, and what it does is it, it flexes away from the cut. It's not as rigid, say, as a carbide bar would be, or even a steel bar, a solid steel bar. It, it'll flex away from the cut, so you've got to kind of take that into account when you're, um, particularly when you're doing your finish cuts, if you come out to a size and then you run the next part and the first cut, it's gonna cut it over size. You gotta back off the offset. Now, if you're running many, many parts, you could, you could dial that in just right so you could take that finish cut in one cut, but generally for the jobs I do, because I'm running so few parts and the parts are expensive, I just back down the offset away from the or to a smaller diameter, if you will, and, and just take a cut, and then I measure it, and I take an, another cut, maybe two more cuts sometimes if the tolerance is really close. Because the bars, they don't chatter or vibrate. I mean, it's very difficult. You can get one to do it, but it's, it's hard to get it to do it. But they flex, particularly the real long ones. This is a short one. I'm, you know, around here at Centerline and stuff, they have real long ones that are, you know, like a 20, 24 inches long. And the longer they get, the more they kind of flex away from the cut. We're only taking, uh, I'm only taking shallow depths of cuts here too, like 80 thousandths depth of cut, I think it was. Normally I'd take maybe an eighth of an inch depth of cut with this bar per side. That'd be a quarter inch off the diameter. But in this case, I'm taking only 80 thousandths on the radius depth of cut. Um, I've also found that that works better for boring soft jaws like this. It, it'll just break the insert. I mean, if you try to take, you know, quarter inch depths of cut and things like that, it'll just break the insert and it, it won't work. An, an insert with a, a lead, a front lead angle would work better for an intermittent cut like this, but it, uh, of course you can't get to the square shoulder in the back, so you'd have to run another tool in to get the square shoulder and then a finishing tool, so just easier just to slow it down a little bit. Now I'm not so super worried about the actual diameter of this bore with being in a four jaw chuck, I can move the jaws in and out and adjust the part. On a, when you're boring a three jaw chuck, and particularly a hydraulic chuck, you only have so much travel in the in the chuck jaws, and so you have to hit the diameter fairly close when you're boring your chuck jaws. I suppose when I indicated that ring, I could have indicated the tops of the pins. That might have been a little bit more, and not worried about the run out of the ring itself. And that might have made the jaws maybe run a little bit more the same. I could see they're not perfectly running true to each other, but for the case of this, it's not gonna matter. I'm not gonna be turning high RPMs or anything like that. Oh, by the way, on a, on a um, People have asked this question quite often for me on uh, why run a manual four-jaw chuck on the CNC machine. And actually, this is kind of a small chuck for this machine. The original chuck, or the, and I have it sitting here over on the floor, is a 21-inch Kitagawa hydraulic chuck, three-jaw chuck. And the problem with this kind of a machine, these multitask machines, if you put too big a diameter chuck, you have interferences when the B-axis is at 90 degrees from where it is right now, so it's facing straight down with the spindle, the milling spindle, and you're close up to the chuck jaws, you run into the chuck, particularly with a large chuck like the 21-inch chuck. You can, um, this is a 16 and a half inch chuck, the OD of this four-jaw chuck. And um, 
so you can imagine it's that much bigger than this chuck and it and it causes interference problems that's one reason the other reason is the first job i was going to run i wanted the full spindle bore this machine has a six and five eighths spindle bore diameter and when you have the hydraulic chuck on there with the draw tube it reduces that down and the part i was going to run wouldn't fit into the spindle bore that was an additional reason as well as i had to run off center for part of that part and the four jaw chuck is way easier to do that than the three jaw hydro hydraulic chuck you could mill the jaws off center but but it's still a lot easier to do with a four jaw chuck and get it, it running exactly where you want it and everything so that was another reason and uh also you don't need as many different sets of soft jaws for the four jaw chuck as the hydraulic three jaw chuck you got to have bunches of different soft jaws for all these different diameters because the jaws themselves even on that 21 inch chuck only have maybe i don't know a quarter inch or, or a little bit more three eighths of an inch of travel total in the jaws and so you although there's serrations on the face of the jaws and you can move them in and out but you pretty much have to rebore the jaws for each job with this four jaw chuck you you don't have to necessarily do that if the jaws sort of fit what you want you can just adjust the jaws and run it true and the kind of work i do i don't need to um change the parts in and out of the chuck very often i might put a part in there and have it you know at the shortest an hour or two and, and uh, at the longest i've had parts chucked in for a week and never changed it because i was doing all this milling and work and everything else on the part and so i don't do a lot of chuck chain you know jock um part changes in the chuck and so it's more reasonable for me to use a, a manual four jaw chuck and i can get the part running very true and everything and uh, um and it and the chucking that, that amount of time taking five minutes or so to get the part indicated in or even less a few minutes when you get good at it is not significant compared to the jobs i've run also a, a hydraulic chuck does not clamp the part as securely as a four jaw manual chuck does the with if you had jaws this big like i've got on this chuck right now uh, with a higher rpm the, the hydraulic chuck will open or tend to open up and lose chucking pressure because of the centrifugal force on those jaws opening the chuck against the hydraulic pressure and uh on particularly on facing cuts where you're going a high surface footage all the way down to the center with the spindle is speeding up the part can get loose in the chuck and i've actually seen the part a part fly out of the chuck before or I, I was turning a small disc shape part in the little lathe, the, the quick turn 20 over here, and, and, uh, and I, I could actually see the part get loose in the jaws, but because the tool was in front of it facing it, it didn't fly out of the chuck, but I could see this part just kind of wobbling around in there when I was facing, when I, when I had the, didn't have the chuck pressure high enough because the part was so delicate, and it would, it would just uh, smash the part because it was only about an eighth of an inch thick. So you can run into those situations where you have to limit the RPM with a hydraulic chuck. Where this manual forge chuck, when you got forged screws tightened down on there with a, you know, with this ratchet wrench, this long wrench I use, there's tremendous chucking force, and it doesn't get. I mean, it might get a hair looser because of centrifugal force, but it doesn't loosen like a like a hydraulic chuck does. So that's another reason that I kind of like this manual four jaw chuck. When I chuck something with the hard jaws on it, it stays there. It doesn't, it doesn't give me problems like that. Okay, here's our, um, I don't know what we're doing here. I'm gonna have to check my program here. I'm going to uh, stop here. I'm gonna cut that roughing cycle off and just run a finish pass on this program. That's why you want to stand at the machine and watch things, particularly if you only run it one time. I could probably get away with the way that just is right now because this is a four jaw chuck and I'm going to back these jaws off. But I, the finish is a little bit rough. And also my uh, 
I think my insert's probably worn out. Let's see. So this is probably, in one respect, um, in one respect, it's probably good that I did this. Because now I can I make sure the spindle's unclamped. I can ro rotate this back around. And I'll get me an uh, Allen wrench here. Move this out of the way. The camera camera's a little bit in my way here. Probably wasn't the right. Wow, that insert's hot. Probably wasn't the right grade to actually uh, insert's worn out anyway. There's no good cutting edge left on it. Let me put a. Uh, I don't even know if this is the same kind of insert, but I'll stick it in there. Okay. Orient the spindle back. Clamp it. I'm going to modify the program just to do a finish cut in here now. Let's see if I can handhold this, this phone and show you what I did wrong here. See this number right down here? Has to be a um, 8. That's the, the tool offset that I'm using. I forgot to change that. And I think this one also, what, see there's a two on there. I forgot to change these numbers. So now I think we're gonna be, okay. And that's the finish pass. So now I'm gonna suppress the roughing pass here. And then I'm gonna process code. And now we've got just a finish bore cycle. And we will open our save as, I should say, save as. And we're gonna go documents, program transfer. We're gonna save it as that one. Okay. Override it, yes. All right. Then, got to go back to the machine and program file and we're going to delete this program, erase 7088 input and then wait, 7088 a. This this uh, keyboard is old on this machine in it, and I'm gonna go over to here. See if I can do this one-handed. Program transfer. Hey, this mouse. And we're going to refresh this. It's hard to do one-handed because this mouse is um I don't know if I can do this one-handed. I don't think I can do this one-handed, but I gotta drag that file over to there, so let me do that. The machine's gonna come back up and down, up to the tool change position, if you will. Good. All right. I'm gonna watch it carefully here, make sure I didn't do any screw-ups because I keep getting the offsets wrong in the program. Let's slow it down. I'm gonna actually bring it in single block. All right, that looks pretty good. I'm gonna stop things here. This is the way I do it when I make when I make videos, actually, I, uh, I stop the machine and then I move the camera. I don't know if you can see it there, all right. And I just edit all this out of the video when I do it. I'm gonna make sure the spindle's not gonna hit the camera here. We're gonna take this finish pass, put it back into memory. See, this takes 
This takes a lot of time, but you don't see it in the video. I have to stop the machine at certain points I can stop it at in single block. And then, uh, and then reposition uh, the camera. Okay, this finished pass return of 450 surface footage, 5,000 speed per revolution on the tool. So the actual RPM is uh, 429 RPM, 2.1 inches per minute feed rate in inches per minute. So that's uh I hadn't made so many screw-ups with the program. Of course, it, it was better that I stopped it because I, the insert was chipped and I had to index it. So that was probably good anyway. Usually I'll, I'll put a stop in the program to do that anyway. That kind of a hurry making the video here and everything. Didn't do that. I'm gonna slow the rapid down. I, I didn't see it hit anything on the simulation, but just for one set of chuck jaws, I don't want to run into something and destroy it. That Boeing bar costs $1,600. I don't want to damage it. And the head on top of it costs another $300. So I don't want to damage those things. Almost to the end, we've got three quarters of an inch to go here. And then it's gonna face down a little bit. And I'm not even gonna measure the diameter because I don't really care. It's gonna be close enough. It's gonna be within five or 10 thousandths, easy. And uh, I'm just going to uh, chuck on the part because that radius on those jaws will be close enough and a four jaw chuck I can adjust the jaws. All right, everything looks okay. All right, open the doors. As soon as the chuck stops, it won't let me open the doors until that chuck stops moving. Let's see what the result is here you can see it let me get a light probably see it better with a light not too bad I can live with that just chuck jaws after all actually a pretty shiny finish so let me um, chuck the part in there. I'm gonna put it back into, um, I'm gonna connect the C axis because it's just easier to, when it's connected and I can jog the, the, the C axis with the hand wheel like that and it's just easier to do this and then uh, let's see I'm gonna I usually loosen the the fourth the number one and the number four jaw when I chuck things in this chuck so that's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna rotate this around so I'm not gonna move the other two jaws because in theory they would be in the right place, but in actuality, they're gonna be in a little bit too far. Normally, I'll, uh, I'll back off the, the jaw about, got some big ass burrs here. I don't wanna cut myself on the, Gonna break those off. And normally, I back off the the other two jaws, maybe about a, a I don't know, a, a little bit of a turn, 
but I'm not going to do that in this case. Not that worried about that. So, see if my part sort of. Although I might have to to get the part in there. Now these jaws cover. These jaws cover so much area. I'm just going to back them off a ways. Oop, sorry. Hit the camera with the wrench. Kind of close in here. Ever since I was in that accident with my truck, I can't, uh, I can't really hold things for extended periods of time. They're this heavy, this, I don't know what this part weighs, maybe about 30 or 40 pounds or so. Maybe not that much, I don't know. Weighs enough to be uncomfortable after a period of time. So I'm gonna retention that jaw just a little bit. I'm trying to, I, now my normal, my original idea, but this part has changed. They just changed the design of it. But I want to run, I don't know if you can see that. Let me reposition the camera a little bit. And so I wanted this, this part of the part between those jaws like that. But now they've changed the design. They took all these features out of the part. So I really don't need to worry about that anymore. But even still, I'm gonna chuck onto it like that because it gives me better coverage on the jaws. All right, I'm going to break this burr off of here. Normally, it's probably a good idea to deburr the jaws. Now I'm gonna get a dial indicator out. We're gonna run it on this diameter here. I gotta to change tools to tool number, uh, tool number 80 is the tool I use for the Hamer probe, which I'm gonna to need too, to set my uh, Z zero. And uh, also the, my dial indicator, I stick it in tool number 80. I, I change to that tool every time so I know where I'm at. Because on, on this machine, if you have a lathe tool and a spindle like that boring bar, it offsets the tool to the tip of the insert and you don't get an accurate reading. You can't use that offset when you're trying to use the Hamer probe or something like that. Dial indicator, it probably wouldn't matter, but Okay, we're gonna run down to here. Orient the spindle. Clamp it. I'm gonna put this. Oh, see, ever since that car accident, man, that even though my, my other arm, I hurt my other arm on my right arm, I've seemed to have overstressed my left arm over a period of time because of that, because now I tend to use my, my left hand for certain things more than I used to. And now, it hurts me to reach out a distance like that, even with this, uh, this tool holder and this indicator, which I don't know how much that weighs, probably 10 pounds maybe, or thereabouts. Not the most ideal. Not the most ideal angle on this uh, indicator, but. I'll have to work with that. I might be able to uh, get it a little bit straighter. I want to hit the chuck jaws. This will work okay though. Oop. 
So you gotta be ready to lift this up. That's gonna knock the indicator out of whack. Tighten this one up. Roughly zero before, so oop, halfway. I'm gonna re adjust this a little bit. Trying to get these two jaws in the right place. Okay. Go backwards to the other jaw. Trying to avoid that slot, that notch in the... The reason I put that notch to begin with in the this groove in the part so I wouldn't have to turn into that notch, but they changed the design on me. This is the reason this job got held up a little bit. Okay. And I had to uh, stop on it. That's the reason I made that gauge. Almost, almost out of battery here in the camera. It's weird when you're doing YouTube videos. You're having to watch all these things, the camera and everything else. And it, whoa, that jaw was loose. See how loose that jaw was? I haven't, I haven't been tightening these two jaws. I'm gonna go a little beyond zero here. So I gotta get these jaws tight. These jaws are almost fully surrounding the part like a collet, Chuck. You see there's only a very small gap here. And so, I'm having to, uh, Okay, I'm gonna re-zero this indicator. Be ready with my... I'm gonna establish a zero point. Normally this doesn't take very long, but with that, that inconvenient slot, this notch in the, in the part, kind of have to lift the dial indicator as you go around. Okay, that looks pretty good. I'm gonna make sure all the jaws are tight now. Okay. We're gonna lift it over the slot here. Okay. Now, what I want to make sure, because I've been gonna turn in my datum A, see if I can. I don't know if you can see that, but. I'm trying to run the dial indicator. Oh, uh oh, man, see, I screwed up. Went off the end of the part. But what I want to do is, let me zero that again using the x-axis. I want to just make sure but the part is setting straight this direction. I'll rotate it back around this way. Oh, you can't check it there. I'll go this direction. I want to check it in the both places, 90 degrees apart from each other. Okay, it looks pretty good. I'm happy with that. So. Well, that took a little bit of time on this part because of 
clearance problems with the wrench on the camera and uh, as well as that slot, that notch being in the side of the part that isn't normally there when you indicate a part or not usually there. So you have to lift the indicator up over it. I'm going to set the zero for right now. I'm going to set it right on the end of the part. This has been faced here a little bit, but I'm going to come down and skim the face and then I'm going to set it in. Well, actually, I could probably teach. I'm going to jog this up out of the way. That's zero on the hammer. I'm going to take my calipers, if I can get them in there. And I know this part is 11 inches, 20 thousandths overall length. So, if I can measure it here. Yeah, I can. I think I can get in here. Okay, that's 29 thousandths longer than the finished size. 11 inches, 49 thousandths. So we're going to teach that minus 29 thousandths. Teach minus 0 0.029 input. And Z. So now we're setting, we're setting with the Hamer probe at 29 thousandths plus. And we zeroed it on the end of the part. All right. Well, that's it. Kind of took longer to film it than it actually does to do it. But that's how I bore and set up this for the next operation of this part here. Now that we can start working on it again because they've decided what they want to do with it which I'll explain in the video on doing the second end of this part. I'm not going to have to worry about a, a C0 in this case because there's no milling now being done. Although I do have to do a, um, a blunt start on the thread and usually what I do with that is put it on a different fixture offset and then I can adjust the C rotation because I'm going to mill it in there with an end mill of where the blunt start starts in relation to where the thread ends up being. So I'll actually be running a G54 for the whole part and then a G55 just for the blunt start of the thread.